Colorado Cross Disability Coalition brings you the Chanda Foundation for Health with Chanda Hinton, founder, a look at integrated health care. Okay, tell us about who you are and why Chanda started and about your, about the center. Yeah, so... Okay. Um, is that, do you guys want to start right now? That That's good? Perfect. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay, great. So um, the, the Chain of Plan Foundation, we've been around for 15 years, and there's two various um, parts of it. So we have the foundation that raises the money, and then we have the center that delivers the services. And um, for us, one of the primary reasons that we started the organization was to ensure that people with disabilities had access to proactive, preventative, and integrative health care. Um, and so what does that look like? Well, that looks like acupuncture, massage, chiropractic, but then also blending that into what we might call as traditional, um, med you know, traditional medicine in the sense of primary care, behavioral health care coordination, whereas for us, we truly believe that integrative health care is when you bring um, both of those together so that we stop calling it alternative and traditional or rather it's just all one and it's integrated and it's complementary and it's um, being there for the sake of benefiting the individual with a disability, their wellness, maintaining wellness, um, and with the individual as the core center of the, the conversation and the driver of the healthcare. And so um, I personally have a spinal cord injury. And so my experience with integrative healthcare was, um, what really motivated me to see that other people needed that access and needed that voice. And so with that, the organization was founded and we really work on delivering services. We also look at um, legislative um, process to make sure that Medicaid is funding these services. And then we really work on education. How long have you been, has the Chanda Foundation for Health or the Chanda Center for Health been around? You've been in a couple different areas, I believe, locations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the, the Chanda Center for Health, um, that's been something that's relatively new in the last three years as well, as the foundation has been around for 15 years and then the center we opened in 2017. And so um, the main reason why we really wanted to do the Chanda Center for Health was to really offer that collaborative service of care, which means that when somebody comes into the center, it's not only accessible from an architectural point of view, um, but the, there's also a level of disability competence from an attitude point of view. And so when folks come in, it's it's 110% um, accessible in the sense that people, um, you know, are able to park easy, come into the building easy, from their wheelchairs, use the bathrooms independently. Um, if they need support having, you know, being transferred to and from their wheelchairs for an exam or a service, that's offered to them. So there's all of those various um, kind of pieces associated to really offering disability competent and collaborative care. And then um, from the point of, you know, the, the, the Chanda Center for Health is um, kind of, you know, I would say the voice of or the voice of our organization because that's where the people get their services and oftentimes people don't come to us um, for a one-time service like we become their level of continued care which means that once they come we we you don't leave because your disability doesn't go away so therefore your needs and maintaining your wellness doesn't go away and so we really look at you had a healthcare team that is with you for as long as um, you want to remain at the center um and you know one of the things that's been difficult for us is you know not being able to serve everybody that we want to right like we've had to as a nonprofit which i'm sure a lot of nonprofits experience is that we have to narrow our focus and identify well, who are we going to um really focus on based on limited dollars and funding and access for individuals and so from there um that that's that's been are, are probably our biggest kind of struggle as a nonprofit, which I'm sure you guys um, can experience that at, at some times too. So who do you focus on and how do you narrow it down? Yeah, so right now we focus on individuals um, 
with uh, spinal cord injury, MS, CP, spina bifida, and brain injury. And so we've been able to narrow it um, with that currently. Um, and oftentimes we want to, we, we have a gray area as well because we realize that, um, you know, somebody with mobility impairment um, may not always fall into those particular categories, but at the same time may still have some limited function and um, need the services just as equally as some, I mean, everybody needs the services. I think that that's just been our way of having an opportunity to narrow the focus based on um, our, philanthropically, people get these services at an affordable rate because we have philanthropic dollars that will offset the cost for them. It's either now covered by Medicaid through the legislative work we've done, or the other part is that we have a sliding scale. So through grants or an individual donor or um, a fundraiser, an individual can come in and get a treatment for $5 or $10 or $15. And so that makes it affordable for them to be able to, one, live with their disability for the rest of their life, but have an affordable way to pay for a massage that will benefit their blood circulation, lymphatic drainage, like all of those things that as a human body are really beneficial to our healthcare. So CP is a very broad um, yes. they, I walk, I walk well. So would I be eligible or do people with CP need to be wheelchair users to qualify? Um, there, right now, one of the pieces that we've had is um, individuals, we look at, we look at level of mobility as well, as well as financial. Um, but we're, we're very open to ensuring that we are not, we're not holding back a service to an individual that we know would be valuable. So for example, we have other people with CP um, that do come in and get services. And so, um, and they walk and function um, without a chair. And so that is something that uh, we go on a base by base, but I would say more financially, it's more of the, the issue that drives it versus not. And so mm -hmm. um, just be, because it, it is very broad. And if you think about MS, that's very broad as well. I mean, you, you think about all of these categories and it can be very broad. So even though we've narrowed it, it doesn't make it any easier, right? I know you're on. Uh, so do you have a lot of different providers? And who are your providers? Are they volunteers? So we have um, all different providers from acupuncture, massage, chiropractic, um, physical therapy, and then we have our behavioral health, we have our um, care coordination, we have our primary care. And so um, most of our providers, I would actually say all of our providers, other than our behavioral health and primary care, are contracted providers. And so basically, um, those individuals are not on the payroll, are not salary employees, but contracted with us. And so, but we're very picky about who it is that we choose as a provider. And we also have a very, um, very uh, strenuous like interview process because one of the things that we don't want is to have a, a student right out of school touching any individuals that we serve because we just want them to really truly understand the complexity of the human body, the complexity that, um, you know, somebody with a disability and those secondary conditions and all those various uh, variables that are present, we want them to be very in tune with all of that. And then we provide our own education. They have to do, you know, a very um, intense interview process, but then also shadow. And so we do our due diligence on um, the kind of qualifications that we require in order for them to be a provider with us. And I think that we've been really um, quite fortunate to have some really amazing providers that um, are really um, you know, pretty excellent and have had some sort of experience in working with folks with disabilities in the past. So the stigma around like, you know, how do I greet somebody with a, you know, a spinal cord injury that can't move their arms? Or, you know, how do I empty a urine bag when they're on the treatment table? Like, 
all of that kind of gets removed, which is really great for the individual that's living with a disability because it's like, as we all know, when we're in the world, it's kind of like we face disability so much through the level of like things not being accessible, people not being aware. And so that's very frustrating. And so if we can break down that attitude kind of barrier, it just makes for the experience of receiving the treatment even far more beneficial. Um, I think one of the pieces that, uh, you know, Julie and I were talking about as well was that, you know, right now with COVID, we're really offering a lot of opportunities for telehealth. And I know that that was one piece that we really wanted to make sure that folks with disabilities that not only are they aware of that we exist as an organization and that they can access our services, there's a waiver if they, we help them, you know, ensure if they're eligible for the waiver, getting them on the waiver, like our care coordinators are really um, in tune with ensuring that they're on the right kind of Medicaid um, waiver, if they're eligible for buy-in, all those kinds of variable things that exist. Um, but I, I think that during COVID right now, one of the biggest pieces that we're really proud of is that we, we had to step away from the center for the sake of really being there and um, flattening the curve around what we're all experiencing. But then offering telehealth was really essential right now for sustaining primary care services, whether that be um, maintaining your prescriptions um, for DME, medication, whatever that is, there's that component of it. Um, but, the, you know, just, um, you know, we have uh, telehealth also available for uh, behavioral health services as well as um, is our care coordination. And so I think what's going to be really interesting is that when we go back, um, to the center, uh, I'm hoping that we get to sustain some of the telehealth things that we've introduced during this crisis and um, being innovative, but not take that away because I think that that's always been something that folks with disabilities always kind of have to fight for. And it all depends on whether the organization has the qualifications to do telehealth. And so I'm really interested to see how much um, lenience will remain in that area because I think it's extremely beneficial for um, this population. Can you explain telehealth a little bit more? I, we've got a lot of questions that have come across about what it is and how it works. Yeah, so um, telehealth from, you know, you can, you can, let's say for primary care as an example, they have a very, very specific way that telehealth has been um, put together so that individuals are being seen through whether, whether it be video, mostly through video um, or through phone. The thing that could be really difficult is that if somebody doesn't have their own video capability um, based on, you know, their financial, uh, their financial status in life, and if they don't have internet or computer that has that, that's kind of that one barrier, right? Um, but there is a standard on what telehealth currently um, looks and functions like. And so with that, um, there's the video or the phone. It used to have to run through a very specific um, kind of uh, quote unquote vendor to make sure that it was HIPAA compliant, all of those things. During COVID, there's been a lot of leniency in that because people, they didn't want people to not get the proper services. So, um, while HIPAA is still really critical and important, they're giving, they're kind of lifting some of those restrictions in order for people to, um, whether that's FaceTime or through a different, like a different app on the phone or something like that, that gives, gives that flexibility of still being able to access, um, services through telehealth without having all of those very specific requirements for the organization and also lifting some of the barriers that the individual would have as well. Does that kind of, does that help? So, yeah, so it isn't simply the doctor picking up the phone necessarily. There are some, some guidelines and regulations to help keep it um, private and at least to some extent. Granted, of course, everything went out the window overnight, but. <laughs> exactly, yeah, well, I mean, to some extent, yes. I think that, um, they've always been regulated to the point where HIPAA has always been at the forefront. I think you guys may agree that with me here a little bit in some areas where 
HIPAA is really critical. At the same time, I find some requirements that are being created around HIPAA to actually cause more barriers for folks. And so that's what I've noticed. And it's been very frustrating where they're like, oh, we can't do this because of HIPAA. And I'm like, okay, well, how do we still meet that need around HIPAA, but still be innovative and creative for the sake of like, there's people that have to have accommodations and accessibility needs and all of that. So for me, I, I always feel like when a barrier gets thrown up, I really want to talk about, okay, well, how can we be innovative of breaking down that barrier, just not seeing the barrier and stopping right there? Because I think that's when we stop getting creative. That's when um, we're not doing our best to deliver healthcare um, to everybody in whatever capacity that individual needs it in. And so, um, yeah, I, I get kind of motivated by all that stuff. I'm like, barrier, let's fight it. <laughs> Don't <Yeah>. say <laughs> I but um I was a registered OT. Um I haven't practiced in almost thirty years, but problem solving is right down my alley. So yes. I have another problem question. Problem solving is fun. What? Problem solving is fun. I think that's where that's where we get creative in life. Oh, it? yeah. I yeah. love problem solving. It's the limit to how many sessions of, like, um, massage or chiropractic um, sessions a person can receive. Yeah, under the waiver there is, but actually um, those units are actually, there's quite a bit of units, and so um you would be surprised how many services you can get underneath the spinal cord injury waiver which is the waiver okay. that we passed in 2009 but now we're actually we have a bill in legislation um right now which is on hold as we all know that we're on recess with covid um we're yes. extending it to um other disabilities so the mscp spine bifida brain injury we're adding it in those to in those components and so with that, um, those units will be pretty broad for, um, for, for additional demographics as well geographically. Um, but I think that those that are on the waiver, it's much, for me, that's always the first question we ask is, are you eligible for the waiver? Because we know that there's plenty of units and it's, it's funded through the waiver, right? And then the next question is, well, if you're not eligible for that, how do we make sure that we get you these services through sliding scale. And then based on that sliding scale, we really have a good conversation with them about what feels what feels appropriate to them based on their budget. budget. And so um, it, it, it can be a combination of all. And sometimes we try to upload services where we give a lot in the very beginning to get them to what we call like a baseline, right? To make them feel like, okay, I know that if I get a, two massages a month, that's me maintaining um, rather than we don't want somebody to feel like they're getting too many services every month for the rest of their lives like that. There's, there's a level at which, you know, we don't want people to be financially burdened, but at the same time still feel um, healthy. And so it's never, it's never the goal to have them doing a lot um, in a lot in one month for the rest of their lives. Um, but to start off taper down and then maintain that and, until maybe another, you know, something, a flare up happens or an acute episode or um, then those like, you know, we have folks with spinal cord injuries that maybe will have a urinary tract infection. So they might come in for an, ex an extra acupuncture appointment just to get on top of that inflammation and that, um, that infection, right? So it's kind of like we have a standard, but then we've also got to be flexible with um, when we live with disabilities, our bodies sometimes decide what they want to do, right? And so then we've got to be... <laughs> react to that. Um, if I could ask, you have, and, I, and I've, I've been to, this, to the um, site, and it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful building. I just, I love it very much. But you guys stress the mental health and mental wellness aspect, um, I believe, with every one of your clients. Can you talk about that aspect a little bit? Yeah, I think that, you know, a part of our process when we enroll participants into our program 
is that our care coordinators are usually the first person that the individual um, will meet, which means that the care coordinator will um, bring them in, give them a tour, talk about all of the services that we have available on site, and then kind of talk to them about, well, what kind of resources or gaps in resources are they experiencing outside the center, right? And so when they're in that process, one of the things that we always mention is that we definitely want our participants, we never, we never um, are require it, um, but we do really talk to them about what well, we have a behavioral health provider that does counseling, really focuses on whether that be anxiety or depression or um, uh, pain management, like that it's very broad that I think the term when we say behavioral health can be at, at first glance something that people want to run away from, right? And so I think that we try to use as many different terms around behavioral health, counseling, um, biofeedback, really trying to be uh, descriptive in what it is that we mean with that term, right? Because I think that in the very beginning when we started offering it, I couldn't believe how many people were offended when we would actually ask if they needed that services because then it would assume that they had some sort of behavioral health problem or that, then it's like, no, we just want you to know that the resource is there. And if you want to take, um, you know, an initial assessment with them for the sake of just understanding what kind of person they are or resource that you have available to them is at no cost to you. And so if you need it, it's there for you. And so it's been really, it's been really eye opening because we've had a participant that in the very beginning was so offended and now, he, and now he like can't live without it. Right. So it's really, it's really great to be able to see how um, we just have to be open and again, creative about the language we use, how we describe it, um, making people feel comfortable answering questions about it. The, I mean, I just know that as humans, like that's how we operate as humans in general. So why wouldn't we operate that way when it comes to healthcare and all these pieces? So, um, no, I appreciate that question. And I think that I also look at it as, um, somebody gave me this analogy that we don't, we, we don't, our, our, our head, we don't have floating heads, right? We're not like our bodies aren't out there separate from our head. And so we're, we have a mind body connection. And that when we have depression, our bodies experience it. But when our bodies have issues like urinary tract infection or a lot of pain and you're in bed because of pain, that emotionally affects us. And so when, when, when we give that analogy about how they interact and one doesn't function without the other, that they're very dependent and not independent, that kind of helps people understand like, oh goodness, then I don't have a, there's nothing wrong with me. It's just that those two pieces are um, collaborative and therefore just as much as I want to take care of my body and we go to the gym to exercise or we do this, that, and the other, it's like, why wouldn't we be exercising our minds in the same way? And so we try to also um, give analogies and examples in that capacity as well. That's a great way to explain it. So often, I mean, we hear about the, the or we talk about the one side, which is the, the fact that it, can be an illness, you know, a chemical imbalance in the brain. Sorry, dogs in the background, working from home. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, it can be a chemical imbalance in your brain, as well as, you know, the, the aspect as you were talking about that's connected to what's happening to you as well. And I think that people misunderstand that element of it many times. Yeah, because we, I mean, we have, there's behavioral, there's mental, I mean, meaning in the sense like, there is true chemical imbalance and we've got to honor and respect that, right? And then at the same time, we have that as well as a whole nother level of just being a human on this planet, right? And so it's like honoring honoring all of it and knowing that with all of that, we want to offer a tool and resource so that people get their, their services met. Because if you think about, um, let's say somebody has bipolar prior to disability, right? Or that like a prior to a spinal cord injury, right? So then I want to look at, okay, well, th there's, you gotta, you gotta still take care of anything associated to bipolar, but now you gotta take care of the things that are coming up with the spinal cord injury. And so not separating those two and understanding that the two of them together um, could be, um, if not supported and given the right, the proper resources could be very 
difficult for an individual. And so I want to be very, um, you know, sure that we're, we're showing that there's pre-existing things that happen prior and then, the, then you have the disability and then it can come get more complex around it. So um, I just think it's really important to be thinking about all of that, um, you know. And so I really appreciate that question. I think, it, I think it's great. Do you offer, can those services be accessed by people who are not part of the program or do you have to be a part of the program? Nope, Any, anybody can ac uh, access it. Our board of directors just kind of implemented an opportunity where anyone in community can come. So for example, we actually have some of our board members that come and get services and um, granted financially they'll pay full price for services, but um, they would prefer to come to us because not one, when they come to us, they know that when they're coming and making the payment in return, it's going back into an organization that um, supports and benefits individuals, right? And so, and they know that, oh my goodness, if there's some, a provider that works with the level of complexity that, um, you know, we all often have with, with disabilities, it's like somebody that doesn't have, um, well, I mean, let's talk about, it. I think everybody has a disability, we know that, right, in some capacity, and so... But, but with that being said, I think that um, it does provide somebody that doesn't, you know, have a visible disability um, or, you know, the ability to know that they're coming in and getting really amazing care um, because our providers are so used to working with complex bodies that are very different in terms of anatomy and having rods and, you know, you know, you know, having scoliosis and having, you know, all these different kinds of things that our bodies kind of have from our, our injuries. And so, um, you know, they look at somebody with not having that complexity and they're kind of like, oh, you're a piece of cake. We'll take care of you, you know? And so I think that um, <laughs> a, a lot of our board of directors and donors in the community that come in for that really appreciate that. I probably will be giving you a call. <laughs> I have missed having my therapy. You can't afford it otherwise. It's yeah, yeah. Really crazy. It, it, yeah, yeah. And I think it'll it'll be it, it's really great. We really appreciate um, you know, people being aware of it and then, you know, looking at how we can make sure that we're also offering these services at different spots throughout the community so that way in terms of uh transportation or location doesn't become a barrier at uh at some point. Mm -hmm. I could see that that could be a, a, a future barrier, which may even be a current barrier. And so we're just gonna constantly be thinking about what that looks like as well, um, for sure. Very cool. What other kinds of things do you think that the viewers would want, people listening would wanna hear? Because we talked about the organization, we know that we do legislative work, education, um, services. Is there anything, that, yeah, go ahead, Don. I would like to know like what what benefits um, people see as a result of some of your services. So how does a massage help somebody with a spinal cord injury or acupuncture? Yeah, I think that's a really great question and a lot of people are um, they always follow that question up. Well, which one, which one's more beneficial than the other, right? So yeah, one of the things with massage is that when you think about pain, um, when you're able to, uh, in, in lack of circulation. So if we have edema, um, because if you're sitting constantly or not moving the body very often. And so just, just good blood circulation, lymphatic drainage. And, and when you have better circulation, lymphatic drainage, um, and just the movement that comes with the massage as well, like there's pain reduction that happens in that process. With the acupuncture, I oftentimes look at acupuncture not only as a pain relief, but as a way of really focusing on organ function. And so um, while massage may not, you know, definitely there is massage where they do actually manipulate and massage very specific organs. Um, um, so you'll see people that like in dialysis, like will do certain like massage associated to that. And so I think that with acupuncture, I really look at it where it's more that organ function component where, you know, I do acupuncture to, um, the, you know, have better re reduction of urinary tract 
connections or um, if I have a lot of stomach issues, it really supports that. And so for me, it's always looking at when you have a disability, you, that's your primary, and then you have a list of all your secondary things, right? So your muscle atrophy, your pain, your, um, your spasticity, your, your bladder, um, you know, function, all, all of it, like a constant list of like all the things that your body now experiences as a result of your primary disability. And oftentimes you can look at those things and you can insert massage and acupuncture and chiropractic as a way to really alleviate some of those mm. things to then really allow the body to function at its best capacity knowing that it's never going to be at 110% capacity because we, we live with a disability, right? And it, it, well, actually, and if you think about it, it's like our disability is our new normal, right? So it's like, while we may function, it, it's not saying anything negative about the body because I'm, I'm one of those people that's like, let's not talk negative about our bodies because it's like our bodies can hear it, right? And so for me, I'm really very much about, you know, really sustaining the new normal where it's like, yes, um, I want to get myself to a baseline where it's like, yeah, I may not be walking like I was prior or I'm not going to be really, really sick, but if I can stay right in the middle and know that I can sustain that wellness for as long as possible and I know that I function better because I'm more social, I, I can work, I can, you know, be productive at work, all, I'm, I, I have less, um, you know, de depression or anxiety you know, all of those things when you have alleviation of the secondary conditions and then how it has an effect on the, the mental physical or the mental component of it, then that's really as, you know, as a human, we, that's when we um, are at our best, right? Is when our bodies and our minds feel great. And so we just have to be aware that we have to use other than more medication um, on top of medication and increasing our medication that we've got to use more proactive and preventative ways to address those things. Does that kind of help? Yes, it does. Thank yeah. you. We, we even have like a, we have a little, uh, on our website, it'll even show kind of, we took it from the, to the most dramatic place where it shows like, well, here's a body that's walking. And just by walking, look at all these things that your body's doing just by the simple nature of walking. Now let's take you and sit you down in a chair and then now look at all the things that are not happening, right? And so using these integrative therapies as a way to substitute for what our bodies can't do on its own. And so yeah. um, that's a nice analogy for some people to look at and really get the conceptual understanding of what's happening. Um, I'd like to know what the future holds for you guys. Where do you see yourself, say, five years from now and 10 years from now? Yeah, I feel like um, for us right now, with us only being in the center since 2017, it's very much about sustaining what we currently have. Um, and that is really looking at um, the personnel and our technology at the organization and making sure that I think that while what, what, what we have is a really nice demonstration model to what can expand um, further, even for I mean, granted, we focus on folks with disabilities. I truly feel like our model is what healthcare should look like everywhere, right? Where it's collaborative and integrative and, um, and, and person-centered. And so with that model, we want to make sure that it's um, sustainable. And upon being sustainable, then what does that replication look like? And so I would say in five years, maybe there is an opportunity to be looking at um, is there little satellite locations that are throughout the Denver area, but then what do those satellite locations really look like? Are they, um, you know, not full brick and mortar, but rather our services are plopped into another organization's brick and mortar to where um, we're not having to use extra resources for things, but rather be very um, cautious and effective with the dollars that we're using for the expected outcome, right? Um, so that, that, that's, that's where I see our organization um, in, in that point, obviously in ex, you know, expanding as much as we can at the center where we are now with the understanding that we're always looking at how do we plop throughout the, the community for, um, for any other barriers that might come up. 
yeah, I wish I had, I, I, not having a spinal cord injury, it would be awesome to have uh, medical professionals that have that same point of view. Needless yeah. to say, that's not quite what I get with what I have right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's, it's hard to find the opportunity where all providers want to also work together. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's very, and ours, ours do because we, we, we mandate that they do and they love it. So that was kind of one of our things that, you know, when we brought in providers, we were very clear with them that this is not competitive healthcare, which means that as a chiropractor, you're not in this, um, you're not in this space saying that massage does nothing. And if you're a massage therapist, you're not over there saying bad things about primary care. When, when you look at the complexity of somebody with a disability, you're really truly honoring that all of these services when combined together and collaborated together is when the individual gets the most, uh, gets the, the best outcome. And so that's what um, is most important to, to us to really share that and, and know that it's not easy for all that to happen. But um, if we can keep cultivating the idea and showing that it's workable within a, you know, a small grassroots organization in Lakewood, it's like, okay, if we can do it, the bigger healthcare systems can be doing it, right? And, <laughs> yeah. um, it, it's a great way to just keep pushing the envelope on that piece. And sometimes HIPAA will come up with that too. Like, oh, no, 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 the primary care can't talk to massage therapists because then that's violating HIPAA. And I'm like, okay, so do we get creative and we have them all sign off and we have all of our participants sign off that says, yes, I want them to collaborate. So therefore I'm signing off that I'm giving them permission to collaborate. And so it's like, Let's remember to always get creative about how we're not really enhancing the the value of collaborative care. And so um, it's interesting to kind of be a part of the process to see what <laughs> kinds of things will be thrown at you. And then you just got to um, either catch it, dodge it, or like throw it back. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> do you do any outreach? to other healthcare providers so that they understand disability competent care? Yeah, so we actually are just starting a curriculum. I know that CCDC's kind of done some of this work as well, but we did get a grant from the Colorado Health Foundation where um, we are building a very specific curriculum platform to where primary care physicians, and that includes them, their MAs, and their staff office, can go online and actually pay for different modules. And so the first module would be like just the introduction to disability competent care. So number one, that it's, fe it's uh, federally regulated, um, that it's requirement, here are all the pieces that from the ADA, from the, um, you just, you, there's, there's so many, you know, different citations around like why it's um, required and then going through the, um, you know, some of the, the research associated to it, um, the, the, the provider, why me, why should I do it? And then showing how people, how to do it. And so very, various different modules about just the introduction to the concept, like, you know, not, you know, giving people the tools that they need around. Well, then if I have an office, you know, a primary care physician office, how do I make it accessible if I don't have all the money? Well, it breaks it down and it says, well, it's kind of like you, there are still ways that you can be disability competent without spending a lot of money. If you had no money, you can still do something to be disability competent. And then if you have a minimal amount of money, this is what you can do. And if you have a lot of money, this is what you can do. And so um, it's, it's gonna be a really great opportunity for um, physicians to go on there and they you know just pay and they get their, as soon as they're done with it, they get their CME that pops right out, their certificate indicating that they've gone through it. And so I'm really excited for us to be piloting that and getting that out and um, making sure that, you know, larger, larger healthcare systems are really aware that it's a requirement and it needs to be done. And quite frankly, it's been, it's, it's been way too long. Well, may I bring up something that I'm passionate about? Um, I have this, I have a speech impediment and people often, well, not often, but some people think that 
people sometimes assume that I have into, I have IDD, which is absolutely not the case. About four and a half years ago, I had major surgery. And even though I had seen the provider, provided several times alone after surgery, she, the providers, asked that my mom, she's intelligent. So, um, so, um, <laughs> when you train, when you train, um, providers, please. Oh, we lost your sound. Don, I think what, Don, your sound went out, but I think what I heard you say is that please, when we're training our providers to make sure that we talk to them about um, that they're not making judgments on individuals based on their, how their speech, uh, and, and there's actually a case study that we show in one of the, I think it's the introductory where we show that the individual, um, the individual, you know, she, she had her speech was difficult to understand as well. And there was all of these state mistakes and judgments that were made that um, the case study breaks it down. Like I wasn't given the proper amount of time to explain what I needed to explain during my visit. And then not only did I not have the proper time, they didn't even want to take the time to understand what it was that I had to say. And so um, that case study is really showing that, um, you know, that is really critical for, for providers to understand. Great. <laughs> yeah, we are doing some similar things. We'll have to kind of talk about them. Um, but that, that physician education is so critical, most yeah. definitely. Um, so I always like to ask two questions. One is, and they're kind of the opposite, is what are you most proud of about your foundation and, your, and, and what you're doing? And if you could change something, what would that be? Um, I think what I'm most proud of is the people that we um, have as staff and providers. Like, it's just an honor to really work with people that care about an organization, oftentimes as equally as you do as, you know, the founder and executive director, which you always hope that as you may transition away from the organization, that it's being left with people that care for it the same way. And so I think that's what I'm most proud of is how much people care, how hard they work for it, how much they take self ownership in the, the mission and the execution of it, their position specifically and how granted sometimes our positions can feel um, like work at the end of the day, being reminded and, and our staff remembering like, Oh, I do all of this kind of, whether it be mundane or hard work because Oh my goodness, I'm reminded that when I walk out into the, the lobby or I see a participant talk about how much better they are, it really, it really changes. And so, um, so I think that that's, that's the part that I am the most proud of um, and knowing that we create that culture, right? Because as, an org as organizations, we, we all create our own cultures about like, how we embrace each other, how we support each other, how we remind ourselves of the mission. And so I think that um, I'm, I'm, I'm most proud of that. And then I forgot the second question. <laughs> I always like to know the opposite. If you could change one, and it isn't a negative necessarily, but if you could change one thing, what would it be? Um, I think sometimes, when as nonprofit organizations, because we do such great work, I think sometimes what gets discouraging is that sometimes I feel like we've got to fight so hard for the good work that we do. And so I think that would be the thing that I would change is that sometimes it's nice for things. I would want things just to maybe sometimes come a little bit easier for granted. I don't, I don't know that 
most of us that like to be challenged and fight would want that, right? We're kind of like, that gives us that driving fire to make change and stuff. But at the same time, it's like, I do feel like, do, do, is there a point when we as organizations, when we fight so hard, like we just get a break, you know? And I think that, I think that that might be what I would want to be different for our organization, but I'm thinking that's probably just for the whole nonprofit sector in general. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's just, that's probably what it is. Yeah, so that at times like this, we don't start worrying that our funders are going to go, oh, you know, we have to be more cautious or, you know, just not to worry that the great, the great role that you have funded right now isn't going to disappear because that grant goes somewhere else next time. Correct. Yeah, that and yeah, that in terms of grants or just, um, you know, I think that when you do great work, sometimes it's just like it, it just you just want to feel safe sometimes. Mm -hmm. and. I don't have to fight so hard to like do the great work that we do. And I think that as you, as an organization, which, you know, I've seen CCDC grow and expand and just be like, <laughs> so it, it's amazing when you do keep fighting, the more, the more presence you have in community, the more repu the more your reputation gets increased. Like it does get easier through time, right? Because we, you're, you're more noticed, you're more, people are aware of you. They, it, it, and so I think that those are the, the good parts of when the longer you stick around, the, the, the easier it becomes too, because you have people in the community that really believe in what you're doing and support you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you guys do great work. Um, I've met a lot of your staff. Um, I know a number, personally know a number of your, uh, your clients just because I know them as, you know, friends and people have come through our classes and, um, I think you guys are doing some amazing work and I'm really happy that you chose to come talk to us today. Yeah, thank you guys so much and thank you for what you guys do. And um, I know our care coordinators went through your guys' um, advocacy cor advocate course. And so um, we are always, our collaboration with CCDC in whatever capacity we're able to is really, really important to us because you guys in community are just phenomenal um, and, you know, I couldn't even imagine what our community would be like without CCDC um, here. So it's great to be an organization that is able to be at a level of um, whatever from time to time that looks like in partnership, whether, whether it be around a particular project or just, you know, legislative piece or whatever it is. It's just, it's good to be in, in company with, um, with folks that fight for the right things. And um, so thank you for doing this podcast and, sharing our mission um with with your members and the viewers and um and being who you guys are so thank you well you are very welcome and thank, thank you don anything you else you wanted to ask nope thank you very much you're welcome thank you guys so much yeah you